Web 2.0. Innovation. Trend. Collaboration. Metadata. Software. Metadata. Got the world turning as fast as it can? Hear how technology can help, legally speaking, with two of the top legal technology experts, authors, and lawyers, Dennis Kennedy and Tom Mile. Welcome to the Kennedy Mile Report here on the Legal Talk Network. And welcome to episode 237 of the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Dennis Kennedy in Ann Arbor. And I'm Tom Mile in Dallas. Before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Thanks to Text Expander for sponsoring our show. Communicate smarter with Text Expander. Gather, perfect, and share your knowledge. Recall your best words instantly and repeatedly. Learn more at textexpander.com forward slash podcast. And we also like to thank ServeNow, a nationwide network of trusted, pre-screened process servers. Work with the most professional process servers who have experience with high-volume serves, embrace technology, and understand the litigation process. Visit servenow.com to learn more. In our last episode, we shared our perspectives and ideas on a big project people are starting to discuss. Is there a way to bring together all the parts of the legal tech community in one place and promote collaboration in that community? Um, There is a lot of interest. There's a lot of conversation about that. But it's my sense is that people are all saying, hey, if somebody else leads, I'm ready to participate. So we're still in the talking stage on that one. In this episode, we are focusing on the growing commentary around whether people are on social media too much and whether they also need to just put down their smartphones, tablets, computers, and all their other digital devices in general. Spoiler alert, Tom and I will never step away completely, but we do have some less draconian approaches to consider. Tom, what's all on our agenda for this episode? Well, Dennis, in this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, we will indeed be discussing some ways to get your digital usage under better control if you want to. Uh, In our second segment, we're going to discuss something called uh, the verification paradox, as well as dealing with bias in artificial intelligence. And as usual, we'll finish up with our parting shots, that one tip, website, or observation that you can start to use the second this podcast is over. But first up, um, are you, someone listening to this podcast, one of the multitude of people who've been concerned that the amount of time you spend on your phone, on your computer, on your device, the internet, staring into your smartphone, tablet, or computer screen is starting to take over your life? Uh, We're starting to see a lot of studies and hard data about legit addiction to our phone screens. We're also seeing the rise of digital detox retreats and seminars that are designed to help people, quote, reclaim their lives and their time. Dennis, I usually ask you what got you think, what or who got you thinking about this issue, but in this case, I'm actually going to claim and say outright that it was me. Am I right? You are, in fact, right. Because you've written an article of about this that will come out in several several more months. I think you wrote it two or three for four months ago. The dangers of of print. So if you do want to slow down the time between something is written and when you you actually get to read it, then print is definitely the way to go. Stay off the digital stuff. But the good news uh, is you're listening to this podcast now, so you're getting a sneak peek. <laughs> so. Uh, I've noticed that as summer starts and then again around the holiday season, almost like clockwork, there are will be a set of articles that come out where some reporter decides that um, we're using social media, our digital devices too much, and they, they take usually a month off and they they write a story about it and they come to they're they're amazed with the conclusions that they find a lot of it is they find that you know if they they spend time with their pets or their family or go outdoors it's just an amazing experience and then they at once enlightened they come back and they they write a long article about it now my favorite ones of these are the ones where news report newspaper report do it and like one of the discoveries they find and one of the antidotes to our digital world is that you should spend a Sunday morning um, reading their newspaper and uh, that's a surprising result to me and and just like clockwork as summer starts Tom uh, there was a story in the New Yorker on exactly this point that 
came to exactly the same conclusions in exactly the same way. So you're right. There are some studies, but uh, that's what, you know, you, your article got me interested because it's a different approach because I think this kind of stepping all the way back and then, you know, turning into to Henry David Thoreau is, is kind of a, a tired story and I'm not sure how useful it is anymore. I kind of want to talk about use of all digital devices and not just say social media, but I'm, I have to believe that the reason why most people may be addicted to their devices has at least something to do in part with social media. So it's all connected. Um, but part of this, not only is the data there, and I'll talk about that in a second, but just look around. I mean, I've, I've been in places, uh, the airport is probably the most common place where I'm sitting there waiting for my flight and I look around and every single person is looking at a screen doing something. They're all connected to that. I, I've been on trains or subways or, or on a street corner somewhere, I'll see, and everyone is looking at a device. It is, I think, a genuine issue. And this is not anything that's brand new. This is stuff that's that, that people have been talking about for a couple of years now. There's actually, I guess, I don't know if we call it a scientific term, but there is a term for it, called, and it's called problematic mobile phone use. It has that, I don't know, that diagnosis is probably not the right word. Um, but then there's the other term, there, and I think we've talked about it on this podcast before. It's called nomophobia, which is the fear of being without your phone. So it is a real and true thing, uh, and there have been some studies uh, that, that that say it's along the lines of the average user checks their phone 47 times a day. 85% of people will check their phones while they're talking to friends and family. The average person spends nearly three hours a day on their smartphone. Uh, in a while, I'll talk about kind of what my experience has been looking at mine, you know, trying to, to use less of my phone. Um, but I think that um, I, I think the problem is real. I think really it's what you do about it if you consider it to be a problem or not well and i think there is a great compared to what notion here so um, like you use the airport example so it, my choices at the airport if i have to wait are to stare up at like whatever news channel is on or to do something that's interesting on my phone it was like that is that really a a fair comparison exactly I mean, obviously the phone is going to be way more interesting and some of it just goes back i remember time like in the early days of blogging and you're on the web and people are going like oh my god how can you find the time to do this and i would always just tell people i cut it out of the time i would otherwise be spending watching television and it was like a revelation so i, I think that there is a thing where you're saying okay so if we look at all of screen time and we say you know oh my god people are talking about all these TV shows they watch, all, you know, movies they see, they have to see the, you know, like the first day of this or that. And then you're saying, well, I'm not counting that. My concern is really about the phone. So I think you kind of have to, and, and is, I think you're right, Tom, that sometimes there's an over-focus on social media, but I, and it's best to look at everything, but I, I sort of think you need to, to look at all of the things that you do. And I think that, um, I, I just sort of feel like TV is getting a free pass in in all this discussion. So that's uh, my controversial point to start us off on. I don't think it's that controversial because I think you're right. I think that before before cell phones, people were talking about how many hours people, especially children, would spend in front of the television, and you don't hear that much anymore. And I think it's it's because there's a new a new enemy, and and that's the phone. Um, and I think what we're what we're seeing in response to it is not necessarily the approach that I would take, which is the the all on or all off approach that you can, you know, we'll talk about kind of that whole digital detox, um, which I'm not a huge fan of, but it's it's an approach that is, I think, so drastic that, um, you know, I, I get that there's an issue with spending too much time looking at screens, but I'm just not convinced that going cold turkey is the answer. I, I in the column I wrote, I compared it a little bit to the whole idea of email bankruptcy, which I think I probably talked about here on this podcast before when when people get too much email, there are people out there on the internet who will actually tell you, you should just go ahead and delete all of it, declare email bankruptcy, write all the people who might have written you an email and said, sorry, I deleted your email. If it was important, send it back to me. It's that kind of drastic approach that I think is not useful. And I, that's how I kind of compare this is going cold turkey on, on your digital digital devices, I don't think it might get you relaxed in the meantime, but I don't think that it's 
necessary. I think that really in what we're going to talk about here are maybe some more practical ways of looking at minimizing your relationship with your digital devices. Well, and I think that binary, you know, either you're you're all on social media or you're all off is, is sort of what I struggle with. And then that also I think that we all, I don't think we all realize how much our uh, experience of the internet, social media, the things we do is so personalized and so different. Like I will hear people complain about things, you, you know, in say Facebook or Twitter or something. And I'm like, oh my God, like I, I can't even believe you're using it that way and like don't you know about settings and controls and and other things like that and the fact is that people don't but their experience is way different than yours or mine time and ours you know is way different than the next person and then the next person so i i think that that is one thing and that's why when people come up with the, uh, you know, the, the whole uh, digital sabbatical, digital Sabbath, you know, we're going to take one day off a, a week where we don't use any devices at all. It's kind of, I, I mean, I, I, I chuckle at that. It reminds me like when you're, you know, working at a place and the edict comes down that, you know, we're all ordered to relax or we're all ordered to have fun or we're all ordered to build, you know, do team building. And it's, it just doesn't doesn't work that way. So I think it, part of it is you want to look at things and take control and then to say, do I need to do something so drastic? And let's face the time, I, we have both laughed and it is hilarious when some people we know will announce often on a regular basis that they are quitting Facebook or Twitter forever and they mean it this time and in another week they're back on exactly picking up exactly where they left off and it's hilarious but uh, you know it's uh, that and that's why sometimes even given the data and there are some things about addiction and certain personalities and stuff that for a lot of people who are writing about this and who use technology a lot, the the sort of I'm stepping all the way away from this is kind of funny because we, we just see it happening over and over again. Right. And I have to think, I'm not an expert on this, but I have to think that there is a different issue going on there that's maybe not quite so related to our digital devices and more about the need to be part of a social network that people can't get away from. It's that you have come to rely on that network and suddenly being cut off from it, it wasn't all that you expected. You know, I think that there is, there's totally a benefit to unplugging from time to time. I, I've had everyone say, when you go on vacation, you need to completely disconnect. I think that to a certain extent, that's a great idea. You engage with the people you're on vacation with. Um, you relax more. There's some anecdotal evidence that it brings the blood pressure down. It reduces stress. But I have to say, I would never want to completely disengage from technology when I was on vacation. I, I want to be able to take photos and create albums with the photos, and that's using technology, using a phone. I would probably want to read books or magazines. Those are on my iPad. Those are on a Kindle. I'd want to do that. I don't consider that... I, c I consider that I would be able to, un quote, unplug or relax just as well and be able to use those tools. I don't think that's a bad or addictive use of technology in, in, in the context. People, please feel free to tweet at me or LinkedIn at me and tell me that I'm wrong about that. So I'm not really a fan of the words detox or sabbatical because I don't think that completely unplugging is necessarily useful. And maybe I just have a problem with the word detox. I think that's the popular word to use these days. But in other contexts, Detox means you're getting something out of your system permanently. Um, it, drugs or alcohol, it doesn't mean that it's only a temporary cleanse and you can go back to drinking and using drugs. And so I think maybe that's the wrong word. And maybe what I called it in my article is really practicing digital mindfulness, uh, which I think is a much more realistic and practical way of approaching it rather than just going cold turkey and completely cutting off use of all technology for a period of time. Right. And I think your vacation example is a good one. And and it's also why I like this mindfulness, digital mindfulness that you're you're talking about. Because the idea of Tom 
you being on vacation and not being able to to find the best restaurants to go to is is just the craziest notion to me. Like, like a, how I would call some, <laughs> some stress for me? Like, That's right. How could that possibly benefit you? Like, you know, there would be worse than like you know spending too much time on in looking into a screen. So I I think there is that notion, and that's what I come down to. And sometimes I think I come off as a little cranky of going like, hey, just just adjust your settings. You're tired of all the political stuff. Just hide that crap. You know, like it's it's really straightforward to do. But you know, people uh, have reminded me like not everybody, you know, uh, reads the manual, wants to bother to do that stuff, and that is it's work for people, and they just feel like things sh- should just happen. And so, you know, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to accuse people of like being lazy about some of this stuff, but the fact is we all, we all are to some extent. So I like the digital mindfulness in the way that you're just saying, like, let's, let's take a look at what it is that we're doing. And the same way, if you were watching TV eight hours a day, it's, you know, you just take a look at that and you go like, Hey, that, I think that's too much. You know, and then you start to say, let's track through the, what we're doing. And you would say, there are some places where I, it's too distracting for me. So I need to do something where I say, is that necessary? Do I do it in a way that I'm thoughtful about it? Do I compartmentalize it? You know, that, that great notion of, you know, I look at email three times a day and that's it at three different times during the day, period. I don't look at things as they pop in. You know, I got a time for Twitter. I got a time for something else. And I'm not on it all the time. And then to say, hey, look, if I'm at something that's boring and I don't know people and I just, all I'm thinking about is how I get out of there and I have this phone, then it's okay for me to check the sports results and, and do stuff like that. But I've, I'm thoughtful about how I do it. I, I sort of feel like, if you're not that notion of mindfulness, I like because otherwise, I feel like on the detox thing and the sabbatical, there's this, you know, there's this sense that you're you're weak and you can't control yourself. When I think it's that what you're leading toward, Tom, I think is that there you need to be kind of conscious and thoughtful and, and just deliberate about what you do, and that's that's going to make a world of difference. Yep, I know. I agree. I think. I think, frankly, that the approach to that is pretty simple. And you described kind of what I walked through in the article, which is take a look at your present relationship with technology. Uh, you know, mostly the phone. I think the phone is the main culprit, but certainly if you've got a tablet or other digital devices that you're looking at or, or addicted to, that that's it too. Identify the issues that might arise. You know, how often you're looking at your phone during the day. Are there certain apps you use more than anything else? How often are you on your tablet when you should be spending time with your family? family, et cetera, and find practical ways to address the issues, not cold turkey cutoffs, but say, what are the realistic things to do? And and what's interesting here is that I feel like I do a pretty decent job of unplugging from the phone and not looking at it at certain times, you know, meals, um, uh, you know, going out with family, doing things where, you know, in the moment with other people. But for some, it can be hard. What's interesting is that technology kind of has come to the rescue on that. And, and there's been a huge rush lately of tools um, on our digital devices to help us be better about it. So Google has introduced what they call digital well-being for Android phones. So if you're an Android user, go into your settings and you'll find a digital well-being option. And I think it's really helpful. It helps you understand how long you're on your phone, how many times you've unlocked it for the day or the hour, how many notifications you receive. That's a real eye-opener for me. I get a lot of notifications. Um, And it tells you a general idea of what apps you're using, how long you're using them. And it's a starting point for under to try to figure out what am I using the most of and what can I reduce? You know, can I reduce my time on the Facebook app by this much period of time? The well-being part from Android is great in being able to do that. It also offers some tools to help you be better about about winding down or disconnecting. There is an actual something on Android phones called the wind down where you where it'll turn your apps to grayscale so it's not in color, more soothing. Um, there's a do not disturb where people won't bother you. You can't get text messages or anything else. There's a nightlight which brings down the color or changes the, the, the temperature or the color um, so it's more soothing at night. Um, there's a, a feature on Android that I really like. It's called Flip 
to shh. And what that means is when you turn that on, if you turn your phone face down, it automatically goes on do not disturb. And you're not going to get a call when that happens, which I has been really a nice thing because I just put the phone down and I never get bothered when that happens. Now, Apple, Apple has a really a different approach of dealing with this issue. And it's more about controlling the amount of time you look at particular apps. And what's interesting is, is that you can set time limits for the amount of time, but not on a per app basis, at least not yet. You can do it by category. So say that I only want to look at social media apps for this long. It will put that limit on all of your social media apps, not just Facebook or Twitter. It'll put, do all of them. So I'm not a huge fan of what Apple screen time does, but it's a good opportunity to try and limit. They're, they're more into to helping you limit the time that you're with, uh, with, with your devices, where I think Google's approach is more, uh, you know, introspective and saying, take a look at what you're doing and see what you can do to uh, to be better at your phone use. Yeah, and I think the Apple approach is interesting. I like the weekly report that you get that sort of tells you how many hours and whether it's up or, or down for that week. Although, you know, typically uh, well, I find there, there are reasons that it, it varies. So, I, I, you know, I'm actually fairly consistent. And then also I think your, your whole outlook toward the Internet and things. I mean, there's that great cartoon where uh, somebody is saying – someone is wrong on the internet and I have to go out and correct them. You know, so I think that some people have that approach and, you know, they'll just get into f these long drawn out arguments with people whose minds are never going to change, who they don't even know. And you're going like, wow, that is, that can't be a good thing. But I, I sort of think you step back and look at the, the whole picture and, and, on my Apple Watch, it has this thing that reminds you to get up and stand for, or, you know, to move around for a minute every hour. And so I think it's like to be really sedentary looking in devices is, is a bad thing. And so I think that simple thing is good. And then I think you look at the balance of all the stuff that you're doing where you say, am I, am I exercising? You know, am I getting enough sleep? Am I going out riding my bike? Do I get outdoors? Um, and do these things. I don't have to drop using the other stuff. It's like, what is the mix of things? And is that a healthy thing for me? And isn't there a difference between, say, quality time when you're doing something that's really beneficial using the devices versus stuff where you're just wasting time? And and in some cases, isn't it okay just to waste time on and a device is the great, you know, is a great way to do games and that stuff. So I think that's the thing. I mean, I, I guess Tom, I'm gonna beat you to the punch on the Marie Kondo thing, but you know, I think you just kind of step back and go like I look at what I have, what I'm doing with these devices, what's on them, and let me just think about it and do these things spark joy for me or or not. Yep, I think that's right. I'm going to finish out this topic on my end um, with just a couple of other tips and suggestions for being realistic about your digital mindfulness, because I think it's about finding ways that work for you. And, and, and while I don't agree with the totally cutting it off, I think that making small moves that say, I'm going to I'm going to work better at not looking at my phone during the dinner hour, uh, something like that, or while I'm out with friends um, at, having a good time. But here are some tips that I think are also, they lead us to look more at our devices. And so by addressing these issues, you will necessarily cut down on looking at your device. Um, first is notifications. Like I said, I looked at my my well-being. I, I get a ton of notifications. Now, I really look at them at certain times. I don't go race to look at them when they come in. Um, but I had gotten 202 notifications before 3 o'clock this afternoon. I'm not sure how that happened, but that's where it was. Turn off your notifications and you won't get distracted by them. More use of voice enable tools using Alexa, using your Google Assistant, that stops you from looking at devices. Instead of, uh, of looking at it and typing something in, ask it a question and get an answer and move on. Great way to not look at a device. Your email app. Most email apps on phones these days have a priority or a focused inbox where you can get through stuff very quickly. I would enable it if you have it so that you're not spending time going through email on your phone. You can do it on your desktop or your laptop later, but you can kind of motivate 
motor through and just triage your inbox as you're uh, at, when you're on the go and, and looking at your phone. And then finally, I guess the last one is is that if you've got the capability in your car use CarPlay from from Apple or use Android Auto from Google. Both have features that will prohibit texting. They prohibit notifications from coming in. Um, They do a great job of reducing the likelihood that you're going to need to look at your phone because it'll be up on a screen instead and you can access your apps and things like that. It's another good way to reduce distraction. And frankly, looking at your phone in a car is nothing you should be doing in the first place. Whether, Whether you have an addiction to your phones or not, looking at it in the car is not uh, is not the thing to be doing. Dennis, any last minute thoughts on, uh, on uh, that would take us out of this segment? Yeah, so uh, that is a staggering number of notifications that you use. It is, said. isn't it? I, I'm I, not sure I, it's right, I, but that's I, what I it get, tells me. I get so few. I mean, like, I dial that stuff way down. Like, if you ask me, like, my biggest annoyance on devices is that it's the spam phone calls I get, you know, and how they interrupt things and interrupt my train of thought. And, and it's really rare that you get, like, an actual phone call these days. So that's a problem. And then I'll go, I, let's get us out on on this time, my usual thing, which is jobs to be done. So two questions. So what are you hiring social media and digital devices to do for you? And then is your usage, you know, actually doing that job? And then if you're thinking about stepping back or doing a digital detox, what are you hiring that digital detox to do? And like you said, Tom, I think it's just something you should look at as I'm going to do something for a while and I'm going to come back with a different and better approach. Because otherwise, we all know that if, you know, you go out in, into nature, it's good for you. But, uh, you know, if you take your device, you'll find your way back a lot lot easier. So there's there's trade-offs there. Before we move on to our next segment, let's take a quick break for a message from our sponsors. Text Expander is a productivity multiplier. Lawyers love Text Expander because with a short abbreviation or search while typing, Text Expander can produce cover emails for invoices or signing instructions, insert templates for consistent meeting notes, perform accurate date math on the fly, and instantly present things you retype all the time. Text Expander runs on Macs, iPhones, iPads, and Windows and works in any application. Visit textexpander.com slash podcast for 20% off your first year. Looking for a process server you can trust? ServeNow.com is a nationwide network of local pre-screen process servers. ServeNow works with the most professional process servers in the industry. Connecting your firm with process servers who embrace technology, have experience with high volume serves, and understand the litigation process and rules of properly effectuating service. Find a pre-screen process server today. Visit www.servenow.com. And now let's get back to the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Dennis Kennedy. And I'm Tom Mile. Dennis was all fired up to talk about bias in artificial intelligence and something he's calling the verification paradox. And uh, my response to him was he would need to explain this verification paradox uh, so I would know enough to, uh, to talk about it. So, uh, Dennis, you're going to kick this off. AI bias and the verification paradox, where do you want to begin? So uh, there's been a lot of talk lately, especially in the legal world, about as AI comes in, what are the the biases that are going to be built into it? And there have been some examples. There's a, a classic uh, Microsoft bot example. There's an AI hiring tool at uh, Amazon that surfaced a lot of uh, biases. And so people are saying, less we need to go in and figure out what the algorithms are and how those AIs are programmed so we can keep those biases out. So this notion of verification paradox, which Tom, as you pointed out to me earlier before we recorded, it's, uh, I picked up from Kevin Kelly, is a notion that says, you know what, the easier it is for us to verify what's going on in an AI the the less useful and maybe accurate that AI is 
And then the better the AI is and the more accurate it is, it becomes much harder to un, you know, figure out exactly what's going on there. And so one of the, the potential benefits of AI is what it's able to learn on its own and apply that. So we are moving to the extent we're not already getting there to a world where AI is going to be doing some stuff that we, it almost is going to happen in a black box. So it's, it's not going to be possible to undo and figure out how it makes the decision it does. We're just going to know that the output is extremely good um, and it's super useful. And that raises a whole bunch of different concerns. To me, it's almost like the it, when we move from the Newtonian physics to quantum physics, where you know you, you had this easy way to explain things, and all of a sudden it just doesn't make sense anymore because uh, it's a completely different approach. And so I think as in the legal world, that's something that's coming, I think is, is super interesting. And it's going to be difficult for us to deal with in traditional ways. So the verification paradox, I think, is a great way of stating that uh, that problem that's coming. And then it gets, goes in hand to hand with the whole notion of bias in AI, uh, which is important because you don't want to build this bias into things. And uh, But it's another, I, I keep coming back to not just like, what are you hiring the technology to do, which is my common thing, but with technology saying, compared to what? So I say, okay, is this AI biased as compared to what? Is it, it biased compared to judges? I, I, I was telling Tom that like in the last three or four weeks, I've seen just staggeringly biased quotes uh, from judges. And so I'm like, well, are we judging AI against an impossible standard? And then we're saying, okay, because it's a human that we know is totally biased with all these historical things. We have statistical things and could be racial, could be sexist, could be all these other things. That's okay because there's a human. Uh, but the AIs, we need to make sure there's not even one bit of bias. And that's that's a trade-off we'll have to look at. I think it's truly important for society. And I, it's kind of, I just kind of wanted to raise it because I thought this verification paradox was a, a a nice way of setting up that coming problem. So I don't know, Tom, did I convince you, explain anything to you, or uh, are you ready to just move on? Well, so I'm not ready to move on, but I will tell you what confused me about this, and I'm going to head down a rabbit trail, and then I'm going to veer back into the path that we're talking about, is that the link where Kevin Kelly discusses the verification paradox, it takes us to an article that has nothing to do with what you just described. And it's about something called an adversarial example, where an AI sees something different than the human eye does. It's not necessarily related to bias. For example, when we see a pic picture of a machine gun, but the AI tells us it's a picture of a helicopter. And researchers have thought that that was the AI hallucinating, but current thinking is really that it's actually the humans that are hallucinating. And I can't even wrap my head around all that. So I'm going to move away from this adversarial example thing and I'm going to come back to bias, which really is something that I can get my head around and I can understand. And what's interesting to me is, is, that, is that researchers have identified, you talked about the biases that, that an AI can adjust. Researchers have identified over 180 biases. Any one of them can affect the way that we make decisions. And if they find their way into an artificial intelligence, that's going to affect it. And the question is, can that erode the trust that we have from the machine's outputs? So that's what's interesting to me. And, and those biases can enter really at three different places in the whole thing. One, it's where you frame the problem when you're trying to frame the problem a certain way. You can introduce bias that way. You can introduce bias into an artificial intelligence through where the data that you collect reflects existing prejudices, or maybe it's unrepresentative of reality. So that's another way that you can do it. Or it can become biased when you're telling the machine what attributes you want it to consider. And if you go and look at the IBM um, artificial intelligence site, they actually take you through a an AI exercise where based on certain attributes, you have to make a determination about whether um, a certain type of individual may be more likely to be a re repeat criminal offender based on certain statistics. And it's hard. Look 
looking at those things, it's easy to make a biased opinion. I understand the, the issue. I understand that it's probably going to be important to try and minimize bias as much as possible, but I also recognize that everybody's got it, and it's going to make its way into it. The, the IBM folks say that they have found ways to reduce the amount of bias that goes into, uh, into their algorithms, but uh, I'm interested to see what happens with this one. Yeah, Tom, I think that this is a big topic. I think it's something that, you know, bears looking into. We'll probably revisit it from time to time. There's, you know, no simple answers to this, but uh, a fascinating set of problems. It's, you know, coming down the coming down the road probably faster than we expect. Now it's time for our parting shots at one tip website or observation you can use the second this podcast ends. Tom, take it away. So at the risk of becoming a total Microsoft Teams fanboy, um, I have a couple of cool things about Teams that you may not know that uh, whether whether you've used it or not. But um, Microsoft has got some nice features that are already existing and that are coming uh, to Teams that I just think are cool. And they're just little small little features that have caught my interest. One is the whiteboard feature. Um, They're really doing some interesting things with whiteboards. They've got a whiteboard app that you can save as an image. Um, They've got their Office Lens app that you can draw on a whiteboard and you can take a picture of it and it will turn it into an image um, that, that's perfectly flat. It's a great way to capture your whiteboard ideas. Um, but whiteboarding is also built into Microsoft Teams as well. So if you're meeting with people online, you can just open a whiteboard session and create it and save that document to, uh, to OneDrive or to SharePoint. It also has, I'm not sure if you're aware, but it also has the ability to host live events, um, something that I'm going to be interested in looking at because you can actually host you know, live video events, live webinars for lots and lots and lots of people. It's using kind of the Skype back end, so it's a reasonably trusted platform for online events. Um, and I'm interested in learning more about that. Um, the one that I learned about this past week, which could either be a really cool thing or a really bad thing, is you can show a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, You can have a meeting in Teams and you can show a PowerPoint presentation, which is not all that interesting in and of itself. But when you are presenting in PowerPoint, um, the people that you're presenting to have the ability on their screen to flip backwards or forwards in the PowerPoint deck to, you know, if they missed a slide and they want to go back and take some notes or if they kind of want to see what's coming, um, they have the ability to do that and it doesn't affect your presentation at all. They're just flipping through the document on their own and they can see it. Um, Now, I, I can see where flipping ahead for your audience might not be the best thing to do, but I think that the fact that they make this available to you while you're presenting is something that I've not seen before and I think it's a unique innovation that Teams is, is developing. So Teams continues to win me over as, I, in my opinion, a better tool than Slack for working teams to manage and to collaborate with. Um, and these are just a couple of examples that I found interesting. Dennis. Yeah, I, I, I think Teams is really an interesting platform as it is, and they're building more things into it. And, you know, so so maybe it's going to uh, you know, actually come through on some of the the early promises that we thought were going to be there with this SharePoint. I know it's different, but it's sort of like a, a really cool set, a platform of, for collaboration. So I'm always interested when you report these things. So for my parting shot, I'm going back to something I talked about, I think a few episodes ago. I'm I'm really fascinated by the notion of of soundscaping. Since you uh, tucked me into getting Spotify, Tom, and so I do like the ambient uh, music, you know, creativity music when I'm working, that sort of thing. But uh, you know, lately I've been I've been exploring sleeping music. So there are playlists that are optimized to help you sleep either deep sleep or fall asleep, um, that sort of thing. And so I've been playing with those, and it's just been a huge help to me in sleeping. So a number of of playlists out there, there's a big one called Deep Sleep on Spotify. And, uh, you know, you just put uh, the headphone or the earbuds thing is a little bit tricky. I'm still trying to find the perfect result for that. But if you're just having trouble falling asleep or you have those nights when your mind is kind of racing, it's it's a really interesting use of sound, and there are people out there who've tried to optimize um, lists to help you fall asleep. So just another fascinating area of where you can, uh, to go back to the our first segment, you can actually use your digital devices to help you relax and uh, do things better. 
And so that wraps it up for this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. You can find show notes for this episode at tkmreport.com. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes or on the Legal Talk Network site where you can find archives of all of our previous podcasts. You can suggest a topic for us at our Google Doc. It is at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash two, capital Q, capital N, W-H, capital Z, U. That's a mouthful. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please reach out to us. We're both on LinkedIn. We're on Twitter. You can always leave us a voicemail. We love to get questions for our B segment. We haven't had any in a while. We'd love for somebody to ask a question. That number is 720-441-6820. That's 720 420- 416820. So until the next podcast, I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy. And you've been listening to the Kennedy Mile Report, a podcast on legal technology with an internet focus. If you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts. And we'll see you next time for another episode of the Kennedy Mile Report on the Legal Talk Network. Thanks for listening to the Kennedy Mile Report. Check out Dennis and Tom's book. The Lawyer's Guide to Collaboration Tools and Technologies, Smart Ways to Work Together, from ABA Books or Amazon. And join us every other week for another edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, only on the Legal Talk Network.